Now we're going to move on to our third speaker and final speaker, Sheila Jeffries from the UK. Uh, Sheila Jeffries writes in the area of sexual politics, international gender politics, lesbian and gay politics. She has written 18 books on the history and politics of sexuality. Originally from the UK, Sheila moved to Melbourne in 1991 to take up a position at the University of Melbourne. She retired back to the UK in 2015 and has been actively involved in feminist and lesbian feminist politics, particularly around the issue of sexual violence since 1973. She's a director of Women's Declaration in, uh, International and a co-author of the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights. And today I'm really pleased to say Sheila Jeffries is talking on um, the topic, the 8th of March principles 2023, a Charter of Men's Sexual Rights. Thank you so much, Sheila, and over to you. This document that I'm talking about came out on International Women's Day last month. It's called the 8th of March Principles, in other words, the International Women's Day Principles, a Charter of Men's Sexual Rights. So you can see from the title that this document is what I will call feminist washed. In other words, it's pretending to be something to do with feminism, whereas in fact, it is absolutely nothing of the kind. It's clever and it's nasty of the way that that is done. Now, the 8th of March principles is a document planned at a 2018 meeting of UNAIDS, the UN Organization to Combat AIDS, and the Office um, for Human Rights, the United Nations uh, human Rights Organization. It was composed by the International Committee of Jurists, and it was launched in March this year on International Women's Day by UNAIDS and the OHCHR. Its origins are impressive, and they're likely to give it considerable weight in international law and politics. I will argue that it constitutes a charter of men's sexual rights. It's a document which is aimed at removing, or so it says, certain activities relating to sexuality and reproduction, and puzzlingly, poverty and homelessness, that's impossible to understand how that got in really, from the purview of the criminal law. So it's very various. The document begins with two principles related to the freedom of women to control their own reproduction, which are relevant to its launch on International Women's Day. So this practice I call uh, feminist washing. It resembles what's called green washing, in which the corporations that are destroying life on earth engage in publicity and some minor activities to promote an environmentally friendly agenda when it's actually the opposite of what they're doing. But at the heart of the document are principles which are very much at odds with the interests of women. They relate to a variety of forms of men's sexual practice and particularly gay men's sexual practice, such as using women and girls, men and boys in prostitution, using children for sex, and protecting all forms of supposedly consensual sexual practice from criminalization. This protection of consensual sex does not, as the document stands, have any limits. In fact, all the principles are extremely vague and they could put under them just about anything they wanted. As it stands, it, it can include practices such as strangulation and amputation and all the diverse forms of BDSM, for instance, and I'll talk about that later on. It is, in the main, a sexual libertarian document aimed at promoting and protecting the sexual freedom of men to engage in their favoured sexual pursuits. Women have never campaigned for sexual freedom i.e. the right to use other categories of persons as objects in the expression of their excitements. What women have argued for is protection from men's sexual freedom in the form of sexual violence and exploitation, something which is in complete contradiction to several of the principles here. Men demand freedom to engage in or inflict whatever sexual practices they wish upon the less powerful, upon women and children in their sexual rights agendas. Women, on the other hand, require freedom from having these practices carried out on them. So men ask for demand freedom to. Men, uh, women, try to get freedom from. There is nothing in this document 
about protecting women from rape, sexual coercion, sexual harassment. These are all practices which restrict or deny the exercise of women's rights as human rights. They're not mentioned here. And that should make it immediately clear that this is a document that promotes men's freedom to aggress against women and boys, and with no consideration about how men's sexual violence limits and often ends women's lives. The document was in fact written by a woman called Ali Giorno, director of the social justice program of the Arcus Foundation, an organization to promote LGBT rights founded by John Stryker, who is still its president. Stryker, as Jennifer Billick's work has shown, is the billionaire philanthropist whose money came from a medical supplies company. He is arguably the most significant funder and promoter of gender ideology today through many organizations and initiatives. The Stryker Corporation is likely to gain from the medical scandal that is the physical and pharmaceutical mutilation of healthy children and adults in the name of transgenderism. And of course, that is one of the principles of this document. I want to say something about UNAIDS. It's useful to consider the interests that UNAIDS, which is one of the sponsors of the principles, represents. UNAIDS has always been dominated by and dedicated to the interests of gay men, who were the first community to be seen as greatly affected by the disease. UNAIDS says it's concerned with a number of constituencies, the first of which is gay men, and men who have sex with men, and others include what they call sex workers, and we would call prostituted women, and drug users. User UNAIDS, under the influence of the gay men who played a key role in the organization, always promoted the decriminalization of prostitution. The feminist understanding <clears throat> that the prostitution of women is a form of men's violence <clears throat> and should be abolished has never played any part in the organization's thinking. UNAIDS has always argued that decriminalizing prostitution, i.e. promoting a global sex industry, is vital to commit combating AIDS. The decriminalization and the promotion of the sex industry is one of the principles in the document. It's interesting to note that the executive director of UNAIDS, Michael Sidibi, stood down in 2019 after an investigation into sexual harassment at, under, uh, at the organization under his watch. As it was reported in the press at the time, an independent body has found overwhelming evidence that organizational culture of the United Nations HIV body, UNAIDS, allowed for abuses of power, bullying, and sexual harassment. One official who apparently had ties to senior management of the UN body's Geneva Secretariat is quoted as saying, UNAIDS mirrors the whole UN as a boys club with hierarchical and patriarchal culture of discrimination, lack of transparency and accountability that enables harassment. And at the time of the, uh, of the meeting at which this document was planned in 2018, Sidibi was the director of what has been called in the media at that time, a boys club. I think it's fairly clear from the 8th of March principles that they emanated from and represent the interests of an organ of male domination. The foreword to the principles is by Edwin Cameron, who is described in the information I found about him as a proudly gay man who is a retired judge from South Africa. He was hailed by Nelson Mandela as a hero for his gay activist work. Most importantly, he has always campaigned for the full decriminalization of prostitution. And in that way, he can be seen as a staunch opponent of the feminist campaign, the international feminist campaign, to abolish this form of male violence against women. Now, there is a bit of a history to the 8th of March principles. They are not without precedent. The 8th of March principles was preceded by the Yogyakarta principles, promulgated in 2007, with a follow-up set of demands in 2010. I see them as demands. I think it's better to call them demands, probably. 
Uh, the Oka Carta principles purported to be about gay rights, but the rights of transvestites were attached umbilically to gay rights in the document. It contained demands for transvestites to be able to legally self-identify as women, and to something called gender expression, i.e. cross-dressing in public, and for the right of transvestites to be accepted as if they had changed sex and were women and should enter all women's spaces. The seller taping of transvestite rights onto gay rights as a tactic has been very successful. The Yogyakarta principles have been cited by many governments and organizations as influencing their policies and protecting men's fantasy identities and undermining women's sex-based rights. Though they do not have the force of law, they have had a moral force, which has been very dangerous to women's interests. And that's why it's really important to take seriously and think about the 8th of March principles at this time. At the UN level, the tactic of attaching the rights of heterosexual male fetishists to cross-dress for sexual purposes um, to gay rights is, uh, is now done under the use of the term called SOGIES, S-O-G-I-E-S, i.e. sexual orientation, gender identity and expression that is used everywhere as if there was a connection. In fact, of course, gay rights are now rarely mentioned without this sort of Frankenstein companion of transvestite rights. And the seller taping of transvestite rights to gay rights has caused many people who seek to, seek to be progressive to assume that transvestite rights are something to do with homosexuality and must be supported. In fact, the Yogyakarta principles form part of a project of protecting the sexual perversions of men, such as the masochistic excitements of dressing at, as and forcing themselves into the intimate spaces of the underclass of women in international law and in national legislatures. And in very many countries, as we know, this has succeeded in relation to transvestism. And men have the right to declare themselves to be women and roll back and overthrow women's sex-based rights. In my most recent book, Penile Imperialism, The Male Sex Right and Women's Subordination, I explained that there have been great efforts since the sexual revolution of the 90s, the 60s and 70s by men to normalize a range of what were previously understood as men's sexual perversions, so that men may engage in these sexual practices openly or even with social approval. The practices I covered included pedophilia, sadomasochism and transvestism, and the prostitution abuse of women. All of them are central to the Eighth March Principles, so I kind of see my book as coming true, really, in this document. The 8th of, of March principles are an excellent example of how far the normalization of men's sexual perversions and of the promotion and protection of the, of the male sex rights have forced their way into the very center of international male domination. The 8th of March principles, however, go much further than the Yogyakarta principles towards the promotion and protection of men's sexual rights. I shall now go, now go through the principles go and, and look at what they cover. Uh, I shall show that the implications of these often rather vague statements for women's sex-based rights and the rights of children are very worrying indeed. Before this, it's all general stuff that don't actually cover anything substantive. This is the first substantive principle. It's, um, it's, and it's the first to actually specify an area in need of protection. And because of course it's International Women's Day that it was launched on, it covers sexual and reproductive health and rights. And as we can see here, it says that the criminal law may not in any way impair the right to make an act on decisions about one's own body, sexuality and reproduction, such as pregnancy, contraception, including emergency contraception, comprehensive abortion care, prophylaxis for sexually transmitted infections, but added on the end, and you can see this popped on, is gender affirming care and therapy. That's cleverly popped into something which otherwise is very important for women and uh, which we could all see as relevant to women's interests, but they just popped in gender affirming care and therapy on the end of that. So they kind of removed that one. And yes, um, the, 
uh, these um, principles generally can cover all sorts of things because they're so vague that could be very worrying. Um, for instance, there is a problem in the fact that in the rest of the document, it does comment that there may be many activities not specifically mentioned in any of the principles which should come under their general object of opposing criminalization. And you will not be surprised to learn that one of these is what they call non-exploitative surrogacy. In other words, the safe trade in which women um, are uh, put into a form of reproductive slavery so their babies can be bought and exchanged around the world. Um, and all surrogacy entails placing women in this reproductive slavery and the, the effects on the women and children are, of course, very harmful. There isn't a nice and cuddly kind. But surrogacy you see, is important to gay men who have been at the center of creating an international industry through which these men can acquire children without having to relate to women. Uh, this is very straightforward. Criminal law may not proscribe abortion, and that seems entirely reasonable. So there is at least, I think, one principle here that doesn't have any problematic aspects and is fairly straightforward. This is a worrying one. Uh, principle 16, consensual sexual conduct. Now, this is the beginning of the document, uh, which uh, is, is fairly clear about being about a men's charter of sexual rights. And this seeks to remove any form of sexual practice which can be justified with the idea of consent from the remit of the, clinic, uh, the criminal law. I'll, I'll read this one out. It says consensual sexual conduct, uh, irrespective of the type of sexual activity, the sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression of the people involved or their marital status, may not be criminalized in any circumstances. Now, the problem about this, of course, is that um, there, there are many forms of sexual practice justified by consent, which are very problematic. Uh, as long as this refers simply to the removal of homosexuality from the criminal law, that's fine. That's a very important principle. Because, of course, there are many countries in which lesbians and gay men face serious penalties as a result of who they love right now. But there are a number of problems. One is that there are definitely some kinds of sexual practice which can be defended by consent, which would face the sanction of the criminal law. Another is the fact that consent can be and is used to justify adult men sexually using children. As I argue in penal imperialism, consent um, is not useful as a way of distinguishing abusive and non-violent sex from that which is a wanted activity. For instance, a woman can be seen to consent or even see herself as consenting if she simply allows a man to insert his penis while she does something else, like reading a book. Men will penetrate women even when they're crying, even when they're unconscious. Such use may be experienced as abusive by women, but she may not feel able to prevent it or object because heterosexual relationships are based on a profound power imbalance. And she's been trained to think that she should allow her body to be used in the satisfaction of the male sex right. And of course the man may be violent if she objects. So this is about, consent is really about men's right to simply use women in any way that they wish. It, it provides an excuse for men using women for their own satisfaction when those women would rather be somewhere else. Women, for instance, we know there's a lot of training about consent at the moment, it's called consent training in universities, in schools and so on, which is supposed to be for the interests of women. Uh, but in fact, women are not trained in schools and universities to recognize whether men have consented to their sexual use because women do not use men simply as bodies for their pleasure. So we know what this is about. It's about the use of women's bodies by men. Nobody seems to be sort of um, honest about this though. Um, men's harassment, it's called sexual initiative to force women to be used is simply unquestioned. It's simply the way the world works. It's how sex happens, it's what happens. Now men don't have to worry about whether they consent if they don't have the, did I consent to that? Can I go to the police? Did I consent? Because it's not going to be a problem. This makes it clear that consent is simply a, a mechanism for enabling the abuse of women. 
Consent, for instance, is the main and perhaps only justification for what used to be called sadomasochism, which is now called BDSM, which is people torturing each other and inflicting uh, psychological and physical pain. Since the 1970s, as I point out in penal imperialism, there's been a powerful campaign, mostly by gay men, to normalize and decriminalize sadomasochism. In the practice of sadomasochism by both gay and straight men, coercive control is normalized, and practices that may include many forms of vicious violence, beating, cutting, piercing, flaying, removal of body parts, testes in particular, are routinely carried out. Um, the, the judgment made as a result of something called the Operation Spanner case in the UK would, under the principle uh, that we've just been looking at about consent, that if all consensual practices should remove, be removed from the purview of the law, the judgment in that case, which is a very important judgment, would simply fail. It wouldn't be accepted. Um, the, this was um, a judgment in Britain. It was a British legal principle established in 1989. There was a trial of 16 men in connection with an investigation over several years into a sadomasochism network of gay men. The main man involved in running, running what were called the disorderly houses in which these practices occurred uh, was a, pig, a former pig breeder. The court determined that any acts which left lasting scars were assault. It was a very, very important case. It was very important to women and their possibility of them defending themselves legally against uh, being attacked by men. The perpetrators were found guilty of assault, occasioning actual bodily harm and the victims of aiding and abetting. The men filmed their acts and this was useful to the prosecution. Um, the gay, gay male sadomasochism BDSM network in the US, in UK at this time are dealt with under criminal law because of this judgment. This month, for instance, a trial is taking place at the Old Bailey in London in which a number of men are charged with grievous bodily harm and conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm related to extreme body modification practiced upon other men. The acts were filmed, uploaded to a website, which could be accessed on a pay-per-view basis. So men were able to pay some money in order to work, look at men having organs removed. The acts involved removal of nipples, removal of testes, removal of penises to create nullos, a well-known practice in gay sadomasochism, in which men seek to make themselves smooth, as they call it. They include the clamping of testicles, they include, too, the freezing of a leg, such that so much damage was done that the victim could go to hospital and get his leg surgically removed. I mean, this practice has been going on for a very long time. Um, sometimes men do things such as lie on railway lines um, when a train is coming to remove legs. And in fact, in um, about 2001, a, a doctor in Scotland in an NHS hospital did remove two legs from men who wanted them removed. But he was stopped at that point and told that he shouldn't remove any more legs. So uh, according to this principle, which is all about consent, all of these practices could potentially have a protection. Now, women are seriously imperiled by the demands of uh, gay male sadomasochist practitioners to be allowed to do violence in the name of sex. The normalization of sadomasochism has led to the introduction of practices of vicious violence into ordinary heterosex, such as strangulation and suffocation. Strangulation and suffocation have extremely serious effects on women's health with the possibility of lifelong brain injury. Men who engage in this practice argue that the women consent. In the UK in 2022, that is last year, a new law was introduced which penalizes non-fatal strangulation or suffocation. This law, I think, would fall foul of principle 16. Now, I need to talk about child sexual abuse, which has been the most controversial aspect of this um, set of principles. It purports to be about the right of young people under 18 to engage in sex without punishment. Let's see what it says. It says, moreover, sexual conduct involving persons below the domestically prescribed 
Minimum age of consent to sex may be consensual, in fact, if not in law. Well, a basic principle is that, no, it can't be consensual because these young people do not have the same kinds of um, power uh, um, and so on. So it's just uh, it, the law actually understands that they cannot give consent. But this principle says they can. In this context, the enforcement of criminal law should reflect the rights and capacity of persons under 18 years of age to make decisions about engaging in consensual sexual conduct and their right to be heard in matters concerning them. Pursuant to their evolving capacities and progressive autonomy, persons under 18 years of age should participate in decisions affecting them with due regard to their age, maturity, and best interests, and with specific attention to non-discrimination guarantees. Now, it's interesting to note that gay men who desire to have such legal sexual access to children have always campaigned for this under the banner of children's sexual rights rather than their own interests in order to sound socially progressive rather than predatory. This was the case in the 1970s in the UK when a campaign by many gay men to remove the age of consent so that they could use children reached considerable political acceptance, particularly what was then the National Council for Civil Liberties and is now Liberty. These men wanted to abolish the age of consent or perhaps lower it to four. Feminists, including me, fought these men and we were successful. But the campaign didn't go away. And it's been ramping up again. And principle 16 shows how successful it has been. The International Committee of Juries took five years to compose their principles, but somehow failed to notice that this principle about the sexual rights of children could lead some people to think that they were enabling child sexual abuse. There was an immediate outcry and they were forced to clarify what they are and are not demanding. Uh, they put up, as they did a few years, uh, a few days ago, make a, an apology, and they say, the commitment of the United Nations to fighting the sexual exploitation of children and the content of the Eighth March Principles have subsequently been seriously misrepresented on a number of social media and websites. So that may be what I'm doing with you today, except that I am in touch with the 50 year history of men demanding under the name of children's rights, their sexual access to children. The Eighth March Principles do not call for the decriminalization of sex with children, nor do they call for the abolition of a domestically prescribed minimum age of consent to sex. However, they disagree with it. Um, so what's extraordinary is that we know within a month of producing this document, they have to apologize because it hadn't occurred to them what it was actually about. Um, somebody's saying in the, the set, uh, in, the, in, in the chat that the principle um, is in regard to parties being under 18, that may be true, but generally it is actually talking about the age of the consent being not relevant to whether the children consent. Sex work, principle 17 requires the decriminalization of prostitution. The use of the term sex work here demonstrates the politics that it represents. Language is important. And feminists involved in opposing this form of male violence do not seek to normalize this abusive practice, but pretending it's just an ordinary piece, um, form of work. So um, you can see from the title, that there's a problem. It says the exchange of sexual services between consenting adults for money, goods or services and communication with another about advertising an offer for or sharing premises with another for the purpose of exchanging sexual services, etc, etc, may or may not be criminalized. Criminal law may not prescribe the conduct of third parties who directly or indirectly, etc, etc. Et so what it does is throw into question the laws that many countries have actually passed criminalizing the purchase of women uh, for prostitution and to um, get rid of the sex trade. It, it would, for instance, make uh, laws which forbid brothel keeping and pimping um, unacceptable. So the principle is very much of a, a, a problem um, for all of the feminist work trying to stop the prostitution of women. Um, and I think I don't have enough time to go through it in, in detail. I don't think I need to. I suspect that women here are very much aware of why prostitution needs to be abolished 
all of the damage to women and women's life chances and to women's health and the trauma that women have suffered and the way that prostitution actually prevents the liberation of women and the freedom of women because it makes women into objects that can be bought. It creates a model of sexuality which is enormously damaging to women and prevents really the possibility of women's freedom. So this, um, doc, this principle is very much against feminist interests. Then there is a uh, principle 18. Um, now, this is the um, uh, gender expression, gender identity. Well, no one may be held criminal liable for conduct or status based on their gender identity or gender expression. It's very odd, actually. I mean, what could it mean? I mean, when you start looking at these things, they could cover all kinds of things. This includes gender identities and forms of gender expression that are perceived not to conform to societal expectations or norms relating to gender roles, the sex assigned, etc. Uh, practices aiming to change or suppress a person's sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression. So that's about this conversion therapy stuff. Uh, carried out with, without the person's cons uh, free and informed consent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fairly general um, um, statement, uh, which makes uh, transgenderism, transvestism um, acceptable. I need to stop. So the Eighth of March principles, once the feminist washing is removed, can be seen to represent men's se uh, sexual rights charter. It's about enabling men's sexual freedom and sexual access to women and children. A document about women's sexual rights would be the very opposite of what's presented here. Women and children need freedom from, not freedom to. We need freedom from sexual violence and sexual exploitation and from the harassment of men. We need freedom from being the objects or unwilling audience of any number of men's sexual predilections. These principles are about men's sexual freedom to use women and children, whereas women want freedom from such violence. Just to clarify, somebody said in the chat that this principle was supposed to be about people under the age of 18 having sex with each other. But it doesn't say that. Um, it says involving someone under the age of 18. So it could be an adult and a child. And of course, all of the principles are as vague as possible so that anything that the men want to put in, like putting in surrogacy and so on, they will be able to do down the track. If they really wanted to say something very specific, believe me, in five years, they could have said this very specific thing in every case. That's all I need to say, really. Thanks.